when I took criminal law in law school, we spent the majority of the semester on homicide. And uh, some of our other classes were, were studying all sorts of crimes, and some of us got nervous that we were not actually covering all the material that we needed to know for the final exam. We were going to have a lot to study on our own, and uh, we were sweating it, sweating it just a little bit. Upon reflection, and also upon studying for our final exam, it became clear that our professor was actually a genius. She spent the majority of the semester on homicide, and we knew homicide inside and out. We knew the defenses that could apply inside and out. And essentially, we had a robust framework for understanding how criminal law works or works. And then all we really had to do was learn the elements of the other crimes and some of the nuances, which we could do on our own. And it was, I think, a very compelling way to learn criminal law. I think it would have been helpful for me to know that that's what this was about and that's what we were doing. I might not have um, sweated it so much. We are not going to do that in this class, but I would encourage you to focus in on homicide and make sure you have it mastered for similar reasons. So homicide is not a crime necessarily. This means what a human being has been killed. There's uh, justifiable homicide. There's partially excused homicide uh, as well. So you can actually take human life and not be guilty of a crime. You can think about that when, all right? Self-defense, maybe the defense of others, something like that. Uh, But for the most part, when people use the word homicide, they are talking about a crime. Uh, This is actually something that will affect uh, all sorts of people. When someone dies and they're not under the care of a physician, also uh, often be, depending on state law, an autopsy, we are concerned with the cause of death. And you will see in homicide criminal law that we are also concerned very much with the cause of death and sometimes the cause of death if there were an intervening cause, for instance, uh, could vitiate the element that was required to prove someone had killed someone else. Uh, So just pay attention as you read. Maybe take extra care during this module to focus in on homicide. So the death of any person caused by another person is homicide. Justifiable homicide excusable homicide, or criminal homicide. So homicides that are neither justifiable nor excusable are crimes. Here's your first line of demarcation, justifiable, excusable, criminal. And when you get to criminal, then there are degrees. There are classifications. So for instance, you could say murder, manslaughter, and even negligent homicide. Right. Your state will have specific statutes toward this. You might have first-degree murder, second-degree murder, things like this. But there's going to be classifications based on the degree of, let's say, something like moral turpitude in, in the homicide that was committed. Here's some fun Latin. The corpus delicti is the body or substance of the crime. The corpus delicti uh, could be considered the proof that the crime has been committed. Uh, This is what the prosecution has to provide. So in a homicide case, at a minimum, it must be proved. A person has died. Another person caused that person to die. The death was unlawful. That it was caused by an act that was purposeful or knowing or reckless, or with criminal negligence. Now, in, hey, there's no body, we can't find a body, it is hard to prosecute without evidence of the body. It is possible, uh, but it is very difficult without body. Uh, so that would make sense, right? I mean, you could, you could picture, uh, how can you accuse someone of committing murder if there is no dead body? It's just as likely the person is missing. 
And so how do you get from what's well, just as likely that the person is missing or has run away to this person is dead? Uh, circumstantial evidence can prove this up, confessions, other things, but it's for the most part, you really need to have a dead body for a homicide case. kind of makes sense. It is also a requirement that you prove the victim died. Uh, now, the, I don't have the time or space to go into this here, but what does it mean to say that someone is dead? It used to mean the person's heart has stopped, but we can keep the heart going. Uh, we can keep someone breathing. So in many jurisdictions, this is a medical issue, but there is a doctor, a physician, who calls it person is dead now. And they may, if they're hooked up to machines, uh, they may have uh, parts of their flesh and their hands or, or their face that's supposed to be pink may be pink. They may be warm. Um, they may look very much alive, but a physician could say, well, they were brain dead. Uh, but at least in historical context, a heartbeat was what we were after. So the prosecution also has the burden of showing that the victim was alive at the time of the unlawful act. It is a crime to desecrate a corpse, but if you shoot someone who is already dead, you did not cause their death, therefore it is not homicide. You cannot kill a person who is already dead. It's still a crime, but it's not homicide. Now, this is interesting, maybe for a, uh, an issue spotting exam. The fact that the victim was about to die from another cause does not mean the victim was not alive. Uh, you, you can imagine um, it's in your textbook. We're not going to talk about it here at length, but physician-assisted suicide. Uh, it's much debate in bioethics and medical ethics and legal ethics, uh, but you can still be charged even if the person was about to die. Uh, we are looking for the cause of death as well. Uh, to be able to charge homicide of a newborn, the prosecution must be able to prove that the child was living at the time it was killed. Uh, there are some states who have dropped this requirement and make the death of an unborn child a crime separate from murder. And those states still have the requirement, a fetus must be born alive. That is, show some signs of brain activity before its death can be considered murder. Feticide. The murder of an unborn child has been adopted by many states. Uh, so this is uh, not an opportunity to discuss abortion laws across the nation, but these abortion laws, access to legal abortions or the restriction from abortions, except for in the rarest occasions, depending on which states have done, uh, you also have to tangle with criminal law on these things. Um, so unless you uh, unless you're considering criminal law, you're not being as thoughtful as you need to be when you're trying to, as a legislator, uh, make laws about this. Uh, so you can imagine uh, if you in Texas, if you were to kill a woman who was pregnant and you killed her and her baby inside her, you could be uh, charged with capital murder. Well, interestingly enough, capital murder, one of the ways to get capital murder as a charge is to kill more than one person. Uh, so it, it is important. This will determine be determined by the state law, uh, but this is an ongoing uh, issue as humans try to figure out the best way to handle this on the criminal law side. Uh, again, there's a cause and facts and proximate cause issue. Cause and fact is sort of the but-for cause Here's an example. Uh, a shoots B, wounding him to escape. B jumps in a river and drowns. A's actions are the cause, in fact, of B's death. If he had not shot him, B would not have jumped in the river. Uh, proximate cause, though, goes further. It's not merely cause and fact. Uh, this is the legal cause of the proximate cause. That the defendant can be held responsible for the death, even though it occurred in a different manner than intended by the defendant. Offender breaks into a house with an axe. Homeowner dies of a heart attack, not the axe. Um, now, in 
business law, you will cover causation, uh, and you will always have to prove up cause in fact and the legal cause, the proximate cause. There's more to it than this, but just keep in mind there are two distinct parts of causation, the but-for cause and the proximate cause. An independent intervening cause can break the chain of causation between the defendant's acts and the victim's death. So A stabs B. There's an injury, and by all accounts, that injury will be fatal. But before B dies, C comes across the dying B, robs him, and shoots him in the head, causing instant death. C's acts are the intervening cause of B's death, breaking A's actions as the cause of death. You could not charge A for murder. You could charge A potentially for attempted murder, uh, certainly aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. If you could shoot the I mean, if it's a knife, it's proving up the manner and means it was used, uh, but not murder because he didn't. Someone else did. Uh, so subsequent causes that are foreseeable are typically not independent intervening causes. Uh, now, this example here is probably not the best, but it still is helpful. So A stabs B, inflicting a serious wound. C, who is a medical doctor, gives B too much anesthetic and B dies. C's negligence, if foreseeable, is not an intervening cause and A is guilty of homicide. So you would have a fact question for the jury, presented by expert witnesses most likely, that um, too much anesthetic in the emergency room when someone has such a serious wound is foreseeable, then A could still be guilty of a homicide if all the elements were proven against him. So murder. What is murder? Uh, we will get to felony murder, which will basically conflict with some of the things we're going to say now, but murder. So common law, murder was a crime. If you remember Cain Abel from the Old Testament, uh, first murder. Uh, you had to have, of course, actus reus and mens rea to prove it. So while the acts resulting in a death must be voluntary, the mental state driving the acts can vary. So first degree or premeditated murders intending to kill and planning the results with something called malice of forethought. Second degree murder intending to cause death but without planning the result or intending to cause serious bodily injury but not death. So if you weren't really planning on doing it, he just showed up and you shot him. Or if you intended to beat someone up, but you didn't mean to kill him, and you did kill him. So even where conduct is not accompanied by the intent to kill or cause serious bodily injury, extremely reckless acts, showing a cruel disregard for the risk created can be murdered if another person dies. So a lot of states have figured out homicide can have various degrees. Um, so let's assume that you have a client as a defense counsel who uh, was three or even four times the legal limit with alcohol. That person, your client, got into a car and drove down the freeway and caused an accident and killed someone. So a state like Texas or other states may have a, a crime called uh, intoxicated manslaughter or intoxicated uh Murder. I don't. I don't know if there's actually a state that has intoxicated murder, but intoxicated manslaughter, uh, or uh, something like that, that says, "Hey, you, you intended to get drunk unless it was volu un, you know involuntary," which we looked at as a potential defense. Um, and it is, uh, it is depending on things. Uh, it you you could get probably not life for it, but ninety nine years, which could be life, versus. Um, if you got in a car and you were completely sober and you ran into someone while uh, driving erratically, you probably would be charged with recklessly causing a death uh, rather than something like a specific statute or crime for in, uh, intoxicated manslaughter. Uh, and if you're just speeding, 
you could rise to the level of maybe if you're if you're texting and going 60 miles an hour, you may be charged because it's really stupid uh, to be looking at your phone while you're driving at all, and it's really stupid to be doing it while you're driving that fast. And a jury could very easily find that you were either reckless or that you were you had risen to a level of criminal negligence. Um, same thing with if you were uh, not paying attention or you're goofing off. I mean, there's there's levels of negligence, and then as those negligence rises to the next level and the next level, then you get into criminal negligence and then recklessness. So as we talked before in another module, uh, there are different ways, mens rea levels or degrees uh, you could be charged with. So, uh, so felony murder, as we discussed briefly before, requires absolutely zero intent to cause someone harm. So unplanned, unintended deaths that occur during the commission of a felony can be charged as murder under the felony murder rule. Keep that in mind, just bringing it back up again. So first-degree murder typically requires this thing called malice of forethought. The primary elements for most states, that the offender had the intent to kill, understands what could result from the action, and then plans in advance how to do it. Uh, it is a mental state of a person who voluntarily, without legal excuse or justification, does an act that ordinarily will cause death or serious injury to another. So this premeditation is the act of planning prior to the killing. It does not have to be very far in advance, uh, but it does have to be in advance. Committing a crime with the use of a deadly weapon uh, is, is a very serious crime, no matter what, whether you cause death or not. So if you, if you commit assault and battery, but you use a firearm, you would likely be charged something like this, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Uh, if you uh, have a firearm in Texas, that's going to be a deadly weapon. But many things could be considered a deadly weapon. So think about a car. A car can be a deadly weapon as well. In a murder case, the use of a deadly weapon creates an inference of the user's intent and proof of malice of forethought. You understand why that would be the case. If you, um, if you had a gun on you and you went to go shoot someone, the jury could say, hey, you planned to go shoot him ahead of time because you carried a gun. You could rebut that and say, well, I always carry a firearm because I have a concealed handgun license or I have a license to carry, and the guy jumped out in front of me. I thought he had a gun. You know, you, you could have an argument, depending on the facts, but it is, it's pretty strong evidence if you took something with you. So I had a case where a gentleman was confronted in the middle of a street, and he was told to uh, get off my street, old man. So this gentleman, who was a tad bit older than the younger gentleman, went home. The younger gentleman went up to the porch of a house nearby and sat down uh, with a friend. Twenty minutes or so later, the same older gentleman shows up, walks up to the porch, and says, Who's the old man now? And pulls out a thirty-eight revolver and shoots him at point-blank range. Now, he shot him in the knee, and he... Uh, the victim survived. Well, that's not self-defense. Uh, it is uh, evidence that it was premeditated. And um, you could charge the older gentleman with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. You could potentially charge him with attempted murder. Uh, now, from a prosecution's point of view, attempted murder is probably more difficult to prove in this case, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon is very easy to prove. He was a foot away from him. He pulled out a firearm and shot him. Uh, and it, let's assume you could get uh, up to 99 years for that. Well, if you're the prosecutor, you want to charge the defendant with what you can prove, uh, what you can prove beyond a reasonable doubt, and you want it to stick and you don't want any gaps for error. So it's probably wise to charge the older gentleman with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon because it's straightforward. Evidence is overwhelming, assuming that the evidence is overwhelming. There are witnesses. Uh, no one ran. He, he 
had the firearm. It had been discharged. He was point blank range. He was angry, right? We have a motive, although that is not an element. Uh, so uh, this is important to know the difference, but also um, the prosecutor, the attorney representing the state here, the state of Texas, but the United States or any other state, uh, you have to make wise decisions about how to steward the funds, uh, taxpayers' money, but also to protect victims and um, see that justice is done. That's your job. And so choosing among different options is uh, interesting. Uh, and you should, if you determine that at some point you want to be a prosecutor, you will have to make those uh, strategic decisions too. I think uh, he could have been found guilty of either. Um, so let's think about this. Why would you not want to charge him with attempted murder? What evidence from what I told you might tend to be exculpatory? Well, I don't think this is a very strong argument, so there's no need to make fun of me for making this argument. I don't think it's a very strong argument, but it is an argument. Um, the fact that he had a 38 revolver and it was in his hand and he was strong enough to pull the trigger, he could have pulled it five times and there would have been five cartridges and there would have been five bullets shot from those five cartridges. And he only did it once and he was at point blank and no one wrestled it away from him. He just stood there. That means he could have kept pulling the trigger. If he really wanted to murder, that is to commit a homicide, he could have pulled the trigger four more times, and he didn't. He refrained from doing it. So if he testified that he didn't even mean to pull the trigger and hit him, he was just trying to scare him because he was being disrespectful, uh, then there may be, the jury may be convinced, whoa, maybe he didn't mean to murder him. He just meant to scare him, whereas with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, he doesn't even have to pull the trigger to prove that. And he did pull the trigger, so it's very likely, and in this case, the state of Texas was successful. Um, and he was found guilty of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. So deadly weapons are important, but they are also cars, and they can really be anything. Um, if it's not a firearm, most states require the prosecution to prove the manner and means, um, that is the how the thing was used. Uh, I don't mean to cause you to watch violent movies, but in the Jason Bourne series, uh, there is an, a fight, that, at least in the movie, where he uses the, a book as a weapon. And uh, you absolutely could prove up if you killed someone with a book. You could prove up that the book was a deadly weapon. It would be a little bit more difficult, but you could. All right, enough on deadly weapon. Transferred intent is key. I think that we have covered this uh, before. It's relatively straightforward. If you intend to shoot A... A is your enemy, and B happens to jump in front of A a split second before you pull the trigger, you have no intention of hitting anyone but A, but B jumps in front of you, and you kill B instead of A, that intent that you had to kill A will transfer to B, and it is not an argument in defense that you had no intent whatsoever. It was an accident. So we will transfer the intent, and you will be uh, guilty as if you intended to kill B. Uh, doesn't really matter if the victim was intended or unintended. So second degree murder is called different things uh, in different states. Uh, the actor intended to cause serious bodily harm such that death could be a likely result. The actor's conduct, though, without any intent to cause death, was so reckless and in disregard of the high risk of death as to illustrate a depraved heart. Uh, examples of depraved heart murder typically involves acting with extreme indifference to the value of human life. Second degree murder typically involves no premeditation or deliberation uh, that would be required in first degree murder. And, and this, is, uh, this is not something that you're going to take to your particular state's licensing test. Like this is general. You need to figure out what it, your state law is, what the penal code says. Uh, you can certainly look it up in Texas to see um, the various stages and definitions. Uh, it may be interesting. You should probably do it just to see if you're in Texas for sure. Um, what second degree murder might look like here. Uh, so again, felony murder does not require showing a malice or deliberate intent to kill. The felony act itself proves the intent, the uh, mens rea for the murder charge. And I've already gone through this before, but if you um, 
and a friend rob a bank and you have plastic toy guns and you intend no one harm and you are robbing the bank and the security guard comes out and sees you thinks they're real guns and he shoots your friend you can be charged with felony murder because during the commission of a felony there was a homicide so the resulting death must bear some relationship to the underlying felony, but in the instance or the example I gave, certainly would have. Certainly would have. So manslaughter, we sort of historically had voluntary and involuntary. Uh, many states just have one, just manslaughter. Some states have added vehicular. Some had, had uh, intoxicated manslaughter. So involuntary manslaughter, at least theoretically, that's philosophically, jurisprudentially, historically, is a death that occurs without intent, but as a result of unlawful activity. Voluntary manslaughter differs from murder in that it's not accompanied by premeditation or malice and is based on circumstances that mitigate crime. So in Texas, we have in the heat of passion uh, or a misreading of the facts and you thought it was self-defense, but it really wasn't. So it's an imperfect self-defense and necessity uh, defense, let's say. Uh, so uh, Suma husband comes home. He sees his, uh, he opens his door to his bedroom and his wife is in bed with someone other than him. And he pulls out his gun and shoots the guy. Well, that's a crime. Absolutely. Don't go around killing people. But society also holds marriage in a different light. It's a relationship like no other. And it is probably the case that a good defense lawyer could convince a jury that he did that suddenly in the, as this says, in the heat of the moment in Texas, the heat of passion. And he was over overwhelmed by the situation and pulled the trigger. It's He's not justified in doing it. But he might be partially excluded. It's not going to be first-degree murder. It's going to be voluntary manslaughter, most likely. So it's not uh, involuntary. It is voluntary, but it's not murder. Still a crime. Still probably needs to go to prison. We don't go around killing people. right? But uh, there's some mitigating factor. That's voluntary manslaughter. Um, so looking at this heat of passion... Texas certainly has it. It's a lesser charge of murder. Uh, the provocation must be of a su uh, sufficient nature, such a nature, and be so great as to overcome or suspend an ordinary person's exercise of good judgment. Well, the example I gave you of the husband catching his wife cheating might very well satisfy that. Uh, provoking is important in the circumstances that are provoking the killing must be such that a reasonable person would lose self-control. This is a reasonable person test. Uh, and also it must be relatively immediate. The cooling off period must not have occurred. Cooling off period must not have occurred. Uh, so perfect self-defense, homicide is either justifiable or excusable. It carries no criminal liability. Uh, so here's an example. There was a pharmacist, and uh, he was at his pharmacy, and someone, actually two people, came in and pulled out a firearm and attempted to rob him to get money and drugs. Well, the pharmacist had a firearm. He pulled it out and shot one of the two would-be robbers. Would-be robber fell to the ground. Then he jumped over and chased the other guy away. Well, he came back unsuccessful with the second one. And the first robber, who had already been shot once, was on the ground. He was lying on the ground. And the pharmacist shot him four times. Well, the pharmacist was charged homicide. The first bullet was probably absolutely justified. He had an, a justifiable um, homicide and nothing more. Someone attempted to use, I mean, he pr presented a, a deadly weapon and he protected himself, self-defense. But after the would-be robber was down, he came back and he's no longer a threat. He kept shooting him. 
so that's imperfect self-defense. Also, there, it, it does not justify the killing, but mitigates the guilt. Like he, 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 I'm not sure if he was charged with first-degree murder or not. I can't remember. Uh, but this imperfect self-defense, in this case, uh, not good if he just would have kept his cool. But obviously, he had a gun pulled on him. There's got to be some sort of mitigation factor, right? You could think about, well, what would you argue if you were the defense counsel? What would you argue if you were the prosecutor? Uh, it wasn't a very straightforward set of events. Interesting, not straightforward. Uh, finally, the involuntary mon uh, manslaughter here, that if you're extremely negligent or reckless uh, and you killed someone, so think car accident. Um, if you're out in the woods hunting, you fire a rifle, what you believe to be is a deer, but you hit another hunter, it's probably involuntary manslaughter. You certainly did not mean to kill anyone. You were just hunting. You you wanted some venison. You you really weren't like you you weren't drink you weren't drunk. You you thought it was a deer, uh, and you shot. Well, that's involuntary manslaughter. You didn't mean to, but it was so reckless. You shot at something that you weren't absolutely sure. Um, that's not a good thing. So you you should be charged with the crime. But we're certainly going to charge you with murder. Now the result is the same: a dead human. A human being who may have had a family, but it's just different circumstances. You wouldn't be charged with first-degree murder. And then vehicular homicide is often under the category of involuntary manslaughter. Involuntary manslaughter.